go. There we go. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to give it just a moment longer in case there's some other attendees joining us. I'm Jennifer Drennan, the librarian here at the Patrick J. Dowling Library, which is located at the United mm -hmm. Irish Cultural Center in uh, the outer sunset of San Francisco. Hopefully some of you saw the 45 on 45 uh, video presentation at, uh, on Friday night. That'll give you a little taste of what we are, who we are and what we're about. With me today also from the San Francisco Department of Memory is Elizabeth Creeley. And she also happens to be on our history committee here at the Irish Center. So we are going to talk today about ephemera, the collection, world's fairs, and the Irish across San Francisco. And let's see, I Good morning, everyone. We're happy to see you. Know that your mics are muted. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So go ahead and write them down or just commit them to memory and rest assured we'll leave some space at the end so that we can answer them. We may not get to everyone, but we will try. Uh, there, uh, the chat dialogue is open, so if you'd like to make your notes there, uh, we will do what we can at the end. But meanwhile, I am going to uh, lead with a teaser because I've been working um, during the shelter in place on digitizing the collection and expanding the catalog. And I just discovered something in a box that it shouldn't have been in that I'm so excited about. And we're going to lead up to that with a demonstration of some of the memorabilia that we do that we did know about because if you watch the presentation on friday you will know that the krb the knights of the red branch were very influential uh, in terms of helping to establish irish halls and keep the irish community in touch as we go that was a dance program uh, celebrating their 24th grand anniversary ball of the Irish Nationals in San Francisco. I'll hold it up for a moment so you can read it. And so they are celebrating on Friday evening, March 17th. Pardon me a moment while I admit a new guest. And this is at the Odd Fellows Hall. The Knights of the Red Branch also helped honor people and events that were important in Ireland. And so this is the program from 1893 that they presented around Robert Emmett Day. They were also a very social organization and we are fortunate to have several of their picnic and event flyers. And Elizabeth and I were just talking earlier at these picnics, um, Shell Mound, they listed as Berkeley, I think, Google Maps now, if it finds it, lists it in Emeryville. Um, but they would have examples of dancing, athletic competition, singing, recitation, and prizes. And one, uh, some of the gate prizes were known to be as much as $10, which, you know, you think that went quite a ways at that time. We also are a repository for some of the ancient order of Hibernians. Uh, artifacts and I love this particular banner because a dear friend of mine who is um, a member of the Rebel Cork Lady Society mentioned that they have similar banners that they wear during their events but she thought this one was was neat because their banners are specific to the event this one the Hibernians if they are going to a memorial service can just turn the ribbon around. It slides off on a little C-clamp. Double That's duty. Awesome. You know, pragmatic to the core. Pragmatic. <laughs> so there, I have to show you this magazine. Um, it's not the most flattering to um, our Irish community. It definitely plays on several of the more negative tropes. But the artwork, uh, the articles are wonderful. This was published in San Francisco in the late 1800s. Um, but this, this particular edition is from 1883. The famine was mostly over, but still the repercussions were being felt in Ireland. 
And so the centerfold in this particular edition oh, highlights wow. the ask and the need for the American, you know, the perception of the American Irish mm -hmm. versus the, uh, the Irish who hadn't immigrated yet. And, but like I said, the articles are, you know, it's one of those, the, the artwork's amazing, but uh, the articles even more so. In the presentation on Friday, we talked about the Irish Fair and the fundraising to build an Irish Hall. And this is from 1898. This is the financial report from the, Cel from the Irish Fair Committee back to the Celtic Union on how the money was spent, what it was raised on, who the committee members were. A lot of this is also really important if you're doing genealogical work. Mm -hmm. uh, because so many records were destroyed in the 1906 earthquake and fire. And yet family members and businesses may have been mentioned in these programs and you will, you know, be able to link family members to, to the, through these references. Now, here's my exciting discovery. I, I, I've barely looked at about four pages of this. Beautifully bound, incredible artwork. And this picked up on the theme of the Irish Fair from 1898. And our friend, Reverend Peter York, at St. Help Me Elizabeth in the Mission. St. Peter's on 24th and Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Put together an All-Ireland Fair. And the, the word of greeting, this newspaper was published. The fair ran from May 1st to May 24th in 1902. And they published a daily newspaper with articles, uh, mostly prose that I've been able to see all the advertisers and the different events representing each of the 32 counties of Ireland. And so here is Father York um, sort of talking about how they put it together and thanking the Irish community because this was St. Peter's Parish Fair, but they had volunteers from parishes across San Francisco and were able to have representatives from all, uh, for all the counties. And it, so the opening night, we have Mayor Schmitz making the, the opening comments, Reverend Peter Casey, who worked very closely with Father York, and they're advertising a brand new newspaper about to come out in San Francisco devoted to Gaelic League interests, the leader. And, oh. ah, but my favorite part of this, and, you know, at some point I'm going to have to read beyond it. Michael is the last page, the wrap-up edition, and it has an entire page. Well, the advertising is good too, and that's another way you can uh, trace family and events and see what was happening because the advertising talks about what's important. But this entire page here is called the Gossip of the Fair, and it features such tidbits as, where's the fun one? Mrs. Walter Good of Luth Booth is reported to have looked charming in white organdy. Mrs. Good distributed many tickets on the miniature jaunting car. Ah. Uh, yeah, and what do we that have? That jaunting car. Uh, that jaunting car, and it's a car. It's not a cart. There's no T. I had to drop the T. It's a jaunting car. Mrs. Judge appeared in grenadine over green silk. Mrs. Judge's charming disposition and graceful manner of receiving visitors will long be remembered by patrons of her booth. And, oh, here we go. And a few days before the close of the fair, Tyrone and Carlo booths were besieged with visitors. What's the matter, everybody asked. It's Joe Tug treating the city hall boys to Clancy's tea, said a bystander. No, it's Miss McGuire's birthday, shouted another. I've got it, fellows. Chimed in a third. Miss Nellie's taking chances. Wrong, roared a fourth. Tis Dennis Finnegan's Meerschaum blowed up. So, <laughs> and there's an entire page of this, and there are more pages throughout. So, again, a, a nice way to find ancestors and also get a glimpse into what they were like as people. Now, I mentioned Peter York, who was very influential here in San Francisco in uh, the late 1800s. 
into uh, the early 1920s. He met with, and this is one of the newest items in our collection, the translation of Mr. Douglas Hyde's Journey to America for fundraising for the Irish in 1905 and 1906. In this, Douglas notes that he was to speak at the New Greek Theater in Berkeley, and he goes on to describe it in poetic terms. Uh, but the day was too rainy when it came to it, and so they moved indoors. Peter York attended that speech, and Douglas Hyde reports that he was, Peter York was so struck by the speech that he published it in its entirety in the leader. Well, I didn't have an exact date for that. So I instead pulled our bound copy of the leader, which is huge. <laughs> I should have had you in here, Elizabeth, to help me juggle this. But I marked today what would have been the issue for today. I'm going to very carefully open this up. And, you know, given everything that we've been going through, um, I was really hoping to see sort of exciting, fun festivities. Well, apparently in San Francisco on Saturday, September 25th, the headlines were, um, British turn loose an army of London criminals to burn and shoot up Irish villages. Lord Joy George orders terrible campaign of wanton murder and arson. Twelve heroic sons in agony of death, Aaron faces unparalleled tragedies. Lord Mayor McSweeney and his valiant comrades enter their sixth week hunger strike. Mm -hmm. And I have read that um, Indira Gandhi took his inspiration for nonviolent protest from the, the early hunger strikers in Ireland. But it's not all bad. There are articles about the women's realm, but what's fun about this is 1920 was also an election year, and so we have an ad for vote no on Proposition 2, the argument against Harris State Prohibition Act, and then help the Chinese societies, various advertisements. So I was really hoping for happier news, but a lot of the leaders are digitized and you can access them from our library website. Uh, they're, they're fun to read in person. So when we can welcome you back in live, I'll be happy to take appointments and pull those out. From there, actually, I, since, since we just had that election ad, I have to show Almost every, everything is Irish related in this, in this collection. We have over uh, 6,000 books and the memorabilia and artifacts and uh, organizational records. The count is just climbing. One of the fun things that we think was discovered in a book that was donated, again, since it's an election year, is this flyer for a gentleman named John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And I was uh, told that uh, several members of the Irish community then felt like they were finally Americans because not only was, and more importantly, um, an Irish, you know, an Irishman on a national ticket and doing well, but an Irish Catholic was on the ticket and doing well. And so they felt like they had finally sort of come into their own here in America as well and were, were part of uh, the community. With that, and this is wonderful, we have this photograph and this letter. And so, um, it says, I would just like to, dear Officer Sheehan, I would like to thank you all for your help coping with the summer traffic here. You are always so nice to the children and to all of us, and I want you to know that I'm deeply appreciative. Sincerely, Jackie Kennedy. Hmm. So that was, that was a fun little discovery as, as we were working through some of the books. We also house more contemporary items like this memoir of growing up in the Mission District. 
And this was published in 1981, so it talks about the Mission District in the early 80s. There are theses. Uh, this is from uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, journalism thesis on uh, the invisible shamrocks and contemporary immigration. So this, this talks about the experience of the Irish who came in the 70s uh, before Ireland's own uh, economic recovery. And then another earlier one, volunteers in big time. So we have these and Okay, here we go. Part of our other new collection, we also have records from other organizations here in the city. Not many, but they're kind enough when they publish something like that to include a, a copy with us. And it's not all, all history. We have, I happen to grab uh, literature and fiction from both, but this is Irish language. We have about 400 books in the Irish language in the collection. And then we also have a range of uh, fiction in, uh, written by Irish authors or on Irish subjects. Most of the uh, monograph material here, though, is um, sociology, literature, poetry, history. We have an incredible biography section and also um, information uh, about the counties in Ireland. This book you got a quick glimpse of in the 45 on 45, uh, some of its artwork. It was published in New York. And again, so it, the artwork in it, as well as the information is just striking. And Elizabeth, I think at this point, I am going to lob it into the members room with you. Okay. So Jennifer talked a little bit about the newspapers that you found um, in the Mission District that reflected, it was, was it an Irish parish fair? Was that it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and the years were 1902, 1903? It, it was just 1902 uh, from May 1st to the 24th. Okay. It was, it was specific to St. Peter, but he drew volunteers from all over. All right. Well, I can hardly wait to read that because as Jennifer said, um, because of the 1906 earthquake and fire, official genealogical records were destroyed. Um, it's in collections like the Patrick J. Dowling that you can trace your family's social history, what they were doing. I know because of what's in the library that my great aunt Anna Creeley poured lemonade in 1898 um uh at the at the irish at the irish fair the irish yeah yeah so this is the transition i'm in the members room a gracious a beautifully appointed room in the uicc where for 45 years people have gathered to hobnob to gossip to have birthday parties it's really spectacular and the type of room that you find in uh in all cities um, that are meant to accommodate the public when they want something um, special, when they want something beautiful, when they want to be um, in an interior space that is, that is gracious. And behind me, you will see the focal point of this room. It is not a hearth, but a hearth. I was told by the board president and Cassidy Carew that hearth is pronounced as hearth, um, at least in the part of Ireland where her family is from. And around it is what most people simply call the castle. And I have been looking at this hearth and this castle, um, you know, for a decade now, and, and really just loving it because it is an example of the type of motif, of Irish American motif that you, you don't see very much anymore in the city. The buildings where these, you know, are, um, have largely been lost, torn down, demolished, whatever. But here, behind me, we have a very, very classic example of Irish Americana. The hearth surrounded by what appears to be a castle. Um, and the what this, I think, really reflects is that moment in American history 
uh, where world fairs and ex international expositions were all the rage. This castle surround is an inheritance from a time when the world tended to gather together in these fairs and in these international expositions to examine other cultures, to marvel at the progress of industry, um, and to, in many ways, encounter the world um, in, a, you know, a time of before the internet, before things were globally connected, the world could come to them um, in events like the 1893 uh, Chicago World's Fair, which is probably the most famous example. This hearth is an inheritance um, from those World Fairs and those exposi expositions. And what I want to kind of push into is how Irish Americans, uh, the motifs that you see in buildings, the, the symbols that we tend to use, how those came to be and why they became uh, popular. Um, why a castle around a hearth, uh, which is kind of an odd thing to put around a symbol of domesticity. Um, so let's talk about a little, let's talk about history. I am tentatively identifying this castle as the St. Lawrence Gate, a real place in Drogheda, Ireland. Um, it was initially one of 11 gates that guarded the town of Drogheda. And it is a specific type of gate. It is a barbican. It is a fortified uh, gate, which is intended to defend and protect towns. Um, Drogheda, as I'm sure many of you know, was the site of a very famous massacre in 1649 during the Cromwellian conquest of Ireland. Uh, so General, uh, the English General Oliver Cromwell, in one of his most notorious episodes of bloodletting, um, led the parliamentarian forces to the downtown of Drogheda and absolutely laid waste to it, massacred um, two to 300 to 400 civilians, killed the royalist troops inside the town, and demolished all of the defensive infrastructure that was supposed to guard this town except for the St. Lawrence Gate, which still stands today. Um, so I'm going to show you a picture of the St. Lawrence Gate as I kind of trace this moment in 1649 to the present moment. But I want to talk now and contrast the meaning of the castle or the gate with the hearth. Uh, wh what is a hearth or a hearth? It's the center of the home. It is the site of domestic production. It's where the family is nurtured. It's where the family um, structure is really affirmed in many ways. It's where you make food. It's where you gather to read a letter. It is the very heart of the home. Um, and the most, you know, really the thing that makes a home a home the, a place where you can have a fire, a place where you can bake some bread, a place where you can boil some tea. So the question really becomes, and this is what I've been asking myself for, you know, 10 years, how does a fortified militaristic uh, piece of infrastructure become an appropriate surround for its almost polar opposite? The side of domesticity, the side of peace, the side of real security. Why would you surround a domestic symbol like a hearth with something that is innately not domestic and is in fact somewhat antagonistic to those ideas. How does that happen? I think it happened and I think that the castle became an important uh, kind of symbol and one that is in, was in wide use for a while because of the world fairs and the international expositions. I think the first one is the Crystal, uh, Crystal Palace Fair in England in 1851, um, which if you're ever in London and you're going out, um, you will go by um, a, a train stop and it's called the Crystal Palace and that's, that's where it was. And this was the first uh, site of an international exposition. Um, but when they came into America uh, in, I think the first one was in Chicago in 1893, Irish villages were always a prominent feature of 
these international expositions. And remember, this was at a time before Ireland was a nation. So Irish America and the Irish needed to figure out how they displayed themselves, how they showed themselves to be a nation in waiting uh, before that was formally solved with um, the treaty in 1921. What they did in these Irish villages was use very static uh, landmarks um, in collection with each other and symbolic objects to create a unified geographical space. And they had some features uh, which, which repeated throughout successive world fairs. Um, so in the Chicago World's Fair, uh, there were two there were two Irish villages actually one was called the Donegal Irish Village and it had a number of features but the one th one thing that it had that you actually entered through was the St. Lawrence Gate. I'm going to share uh, my screen now. I'm going to do that thing where you kind of nervously <laughs> you do it. It worked in oh, practice. No. It's just so nerve-wracking. I'm sorry <laughs> to sorry to like let me get this from the beginning. Yeah, no, it, it worked in practice. There we go. Okay. There we go. So then, what you're looking at right now is the actual St. Lawrence Gate in Drogheda. And I want you to just kind of take notice of the squarish sort of entryway. Um, the, you know, sort of uh, oval shaped oblong build uh, window above it. I don't know the actual terms. I'm having to display my ignorance. But sort of the length of it. Um, and of course the castlements atop, there is a, a place that you can walk um, to, checking my time, to, to um, okay. you know, stand guard on things. But this is the actual St. Lawrence Gate. Um, here we are at the Irish Village in the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. You'll see to the right a little cottage that says, um, Irish village, uh, Don, uh, it's Donegal, right? Elizabeth Donegal Castle. And you'll see to the left the replica of the St. Lawrence Gate, Irish village. Um, there was also a Celtic cross in there, there was a Norman round tower, and importantly, there were cottages with actual human beings inside of them, typically Irish Colleen's, women who stocked these Irish villages to display Irish industriousness. They would spin, they would knit, they would show the home economies of Ireland in a hopeful attempt to capture a global market. This was the first uh, instance of Ireland developing an, an interior trade, a, a, a history of trade. This was sort of, in many ways, kind of like global exchange. It was a uh, fair trade. If you purchase these goods directly from these Irish Colleen's who were busy, you know, knitting and being industrious, putting money directly into Ireland, um, which is a good thing to do if you're interested in Irish sovereignty. So that was one of the villages in the Chicago World's Fair. And Going forward in time, what we have here, there was also another village, and it too had replicas. It had Bar Blarney Castle and Cormac's Chapel and things like that. Um, what we have here is at the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco in 19, another replica of the St. Lawrence Gate. This is about where Moscone Playground is now at Chestnut um, and... Chestnut and whatever that street is, I can't remember it, but it's where the Panama Pacific International Exposition was. Um, there is a baseball field here, and the next time you go to the Moscone Playground, you can remember this huge replica of the St. Lawrence Gate and just kind of think about that. But here is another example of the St. Lawrence Gate um, standing in for Ireland, being used to demonstrate a virtual uh, Ireland. And then finally, here we have a very, very clear view of the castle or the surround behind me. Um, and this has some of the features abstracted that the previous, that the St. Lawrence Gate replicas at all of the Irish fairs have had. 
So I think what I need to say really, really clearly, and let me just kind of swip, uh, switch out of this, is I don't think that the person who built this around consciously set out to replicate the St. Lawrence Gate. But I think the, the popularity of this design and its persistence in Irish villages from Chicago and on work in a way to create a design motif that is generic. And so I think that comes to rest in the United Irish Cultural Center. Um, and not just the United Irish Cultural Center. If you're ever in Duggan's um, funeral home on 17th Street, one of their front rooms where you know people have memorial services has a hearth with what appears to be a castle around it. And again, I think it's probably the St. Lawrence Gate. So it is not because necessarily of the importance of the St. Lawrence Gate and the memory of what happened at Drogheda, that this is around this hearth. I think it has a lot to do with the ways in which round towers and castles and Barbican gates were on display in ersatz Irish villages consistently from 1893 um, until the New York World's Fair in 1939, which, sorry guys, I have to do this to you again because I want to show you how things changed after Ireland um, got its partial independence. This is how Ireland was represented in 1939 in the New York World's Fair, a world fair that was extremely concerned with futurism. This was called the Shamrock Pavilion and it is a masterpiece of modernity. It was designed by Irish architect Michael Scott. And I encourage you to go online to look at this pavilion and to reflect on the change between villages with colleens in cottages and Barbican gates that completely failed the inhabitants of Drogheda, moldering old castles with this masterpiece of modernity, the Shamrock um, Village. It shows you that at some level, Ireland has always been intensely futuristic. Um, it's a really, really beautiful display um, and affirmation of Irish sovereignty, and you can easily find this online. Um, I'm going to stop now by simply saying that in many ways the UICC and World Fairs and Expositions have so much in common and in many ways the United Irish Cultural Center itself is kind of an Irish village in that tradition. It's an idealized um, version of the nation itself. Um, you have one space that is unified with geography that is bounded by walls. This is the notion in many ways behind a nation. And here behind me, you have two symbols of Irishness that are at odds with each other. One is about domestic security and peace. The other is an apprehension of war. And yet here they are in the members room, coexisting in this way to make a cozy uh, focal point for a room that has indeed welcomed many, many people over the years um, and hopefully will uh, next year sometime. So that's what I've got. Rather than later. Later. <laughs> thank you. So, oh, thank you, Elizabeth. And on that, um, I'm just going to point out, I don't have it on display here currently. It's uh, with a, uh, a conservator. Uh, we do have the Irish Fair program. All of its advertisers and events are listed in a link on our website. Uh, we did uh, an All Things Irish exhibit a couple of years ago. And so there's an incredible database uh, from that 1898 fair here in San Francisco with ad, you know, names, occupations, the volunteers, the businesses that were here and, and representing. and Here's a really important part of Irish nationalism, which is kind of a fourth leg. You have the Gaelic League, which is concerned with um, uh, you know, language, um, dancing, singing. Um, you have sports. Um, you have, of course, the political movements, but an incredibly potent force in San Francisco um, uh, and probably in New York and in Boston, too, was the industrial 
um, Irish Industrial Association, I think it was called, and it was concerned with writing a domestic economy, putting it on its feet, putting it on the world's um, stage and making it a going concern because they knew they had to rebuild their economy. And these world fairs and expositions were a huge part of that, even as they had to contend with um, trade barriers um, and um, some people's preference for buying British made goods. If you look in San Francisco and if you look at those fairs, what they're really saying is that we make things that are worth purchasing. We have economies that are worth investing in. And we can stage this even as we wait to become a nation in the precincts of these international expositions and these world fairs. Every single one of them had kind of a fair trade element uh, to them. And I, I, to me, that's like the most interesting kind of part of those world fairs is the way that they just asserted um, their move towards economic uh, sustainability um, and productivity. Here we go. Here is a list building on that in the financial statement uh, from the 1898 fair here in San Francisco. And I'll turn it around, but it talks about all the different booths um, and the, the American booth, the coffee parlor, the Bank of Ireland, the ice cream parlors, the tea garden, the Knights of Tara, the post office, all the St. Patrick's Alliance of America, which is, um, we, we have some of their records here. They acted as an insurance company for the Irish workers that came. And um, so we have records of the members and the dues and the doctor's notices and the payouts for when somebody was injured or sick or died. And, you know, because they were, because the communities were members of these and the records we have are actually from the district in uh, Oakland. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and that's one of those marvelous things that I'm hoping to get digitized so that we can make it more accessible for researchers. Um, but what I find fascinating about this also is, you know, we're talking about 1898 here, and I didn't do the math for the conversion, but the total disbursements for the fair were $35,000. Mm-hmm. And so, and they raised quite a bit more than that. Um, I think, what was it, Elizabeth, when we were looking at the halls and when they were going to build at Landers and 14th, they had something like $100,000 in the bank. Was it MA? They did. It was a huge amount. It was a huge, yeah. Yeah. The Irish community really invested in itself and it really and also did invest in um, Irish made goods. Um, they spent money on themselves. Um, they, they invested in the halls. You when know, they had though, it. Yeah, when they had it. <laughs> Although even when the hall didn't get built, but. Yeah. Well, that one didn't. But, yeah. um, but in growing up in the mission, um, I read a section where he was talking about his great grandmother here and what she did to keep the family together and how his grandmother and his mother both loathed stew to the day they died because it represented their poverty and where they had come from and they weren't going to have it on their tables again. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Stew, of course, is the thing that you easily make yeah. in our first. That's the kind of thing you throw together uh, yeah. when you're over <laughs> an open fire. And it's interesting how foods become associated with poverty. Cabbage has kind of the same um, reputation. It's because you associate it with a time of uh, stress um, and insecurity. It becomes something that you don't, you don't want anymore. Yeah. I'm looking in here because, you know, the brain cells are finally firing and um, I'm just gonna hold so gonna... I love this. Uh, since we all know who the examiner is, let's see if I can get that page up there. This is the examiner's ad in the All Ireland uh, Fair. Oh, which uh, the fair was hosted at the Mechanics Pavilion, which no longer exists. But I love this. The examiner is the paper of the people. And the people have made the examiner a success and it always seeks to represent their cause. The examiner prints all news all the time. The examiner pays all its employees the highest rate of wages in the world. 
and the examiner asks the patronage of the masses, it does not look to the classes for support. The examiner was sort of the paper of the Irish American community in San Francisco. The Chronicle was not. Yeah. The, 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 so when I saw this ad, I immediately thought of that. And That's so funny. Bounce back and forth. Between Do them. we have questions? I think nearsightedly. I think we. I might know. Have. I. This is where I should have my glasses on the table somewhere. Sorry, guys. Yeah, you're dealing with two um, nearsighted people. But if um, if you have the ability to do the hand raise in here, I'm happy to unmute you to ask your question. Uh, there was one question about uh, the online programming that the library has been doing. And um, we started a YouTube channel, which is, uh, I think my screen name, Librarian PJ Dowling Library. And on there, we do have the 45 on 45, uh, the Robert Emmett post. If you carry on beyond uh, Mrs. Dowling, who's the wife of our founder, uh, reciting from memory Robert Emmett's speeches at the dock that she learned in Camross School in Camross, Ireland in the 40s. Uh, there are pictures of some of this ephemera that we have flashed in front of you uh, today. Uh, there's also the Instagram page where I will highlight different uh, things, you know, I'll, I'll get on a theme and I'll snap a couple of shots and, and put that up. And the Instagram page, I think also is um, PJ Dowling Library. I, I have it on the, the center's website. I, I'm so new to social media. Jennifer, can you actually, because I'm reading some of these questions about how do we push our collection online, can you talk a little bit about um, the, the work you're um, hoping to do with California Revealed and our collection of meeting minutes? My favorite. Well, I know. Um, well, one of the things that we have already is if you go to the Irish Center's website, which is irishcentersf.org, forward slash library, that will bring you to the library's part of uh, the website. And we have several tabs and there are links in there that will take you uh, to the leader newspaper and the Richmond Review and some other um, newspapers that we've already digitized. So you can read them. We have in there um, something new that I, I, I accomplished while we were um, sheltering in place is uh, our online catalog that we're still adding to. You can actually look to see what books we hold in the collection. And so what Elizabeth is referencing is I um, was also working with uh, the California State Archives and thank you Elizabeth for that reference. Um, she's the one that told me about the program. They have a program called California Revealed that digitizes and helps smaller uh, collections and special collections like ours catalog and digitize their collection so that they're available online for everyone. And so as um, I just received a letter saying that uh, they had accepted um, my submission application and that final notices go out the end of the year. So fingers crossed. Yes. And also, uh, some of you San Francisco History Days participants may remember California Revealed um, has been a San Francisco History Days exhibitor, um, I think, for the whole time that we've done San Francisco History Days. Um, and um, that's one of the ways, it's one of the great things about History Days is that it puts you into touch with these projects that I, I had never heard of them. And when I found it, when I figured out what they did, <laughs> I, I I was like, oh well, this is yes, you know, a match, this is a match made in heaven. Um, yeah. So I think it's really great that two San Francisco History Days participants are are able to come together and collaborate in this productive way. And one of the other things we're doing is, um, and hopefully uh, the consul will forgive me. Um, because I'm running a little behind with him, uh, but we've been put in touch. We're working with grants um, with the Irish government for the parts of the collection. We have uh, the Carryman newspapers from the 1930 uh, and other um, periodicals and things that would be of interest 
to um, Irish historians, the people going through the Irish studies program in Berkeley and other places. And so we're trying to work with ESP and we were just put in touch with the Silver Bow archives in Montana with what they've been able to do and are drawing inspiration from that because we've had researchers come through here. Um, we have a scholarship locally, uh, as some of you may know, the Leo T. Walsh, which helps eighth grade and high school uh, students with money to go on to high school or to go on to college. Several of them come here for their research and we, ha we have their essays too. But also research has been done for decades in here. The library was opened in 75 by uh, scholars at Cal. Uh, one of the researchers actually was a teacher at Cal. And so, you know, we wanna make this available because the library is all volunteer run. And in the, what I'm calling the before times, we were open Thursday, Friday, Saturday from 1.30 to 4.30. So if you wanted to research, you had to come during those times. And this pandemic has given us an impetus to really put an emphasis on making the collection more accessible to more people. Um, and preserve it too. Um, and one thing I wanna say is- Since we that, talk about earthquake and fire. Yes, yeah. we need to make sure that things live. Um, if you're listening and you are from an Irish American family in the Bay Area or San Francisco, and you know that there's a box under your bed that has great things in it, or you know there's a box in the attic with pictures and memorabilia and ephemera, um, we and if you, I'm going to jump in and say, and you might not think they're great things. Right. But you might just think it's junk. You should ask us first. We've issued a call for content, essentially. The Patrick J. Dowling Library is interested in looking at your family's collection of Irish Americana. Um, if you think that you have things that um, should be donated, please contact Jennifer Drennan um, and give her a heads up. Please um, don't. Um, leave them in a box outside of um, outside of the library door. This is very salty, foggy air here in the Sunset District, and that's not good for old things. Um, but yeah. please do consider looking at those um, collections and yeah, so donating if, them. Yes, because if you open the box and you see a bunch of rubbishy old papers and journals and things, you're like, who on earth would want to read this? Chances are an archivist a Celtic studies person, an urban historian, a, a, somebody else doing genealogical research is going to say, oh yes, please. And so we are, and, you know, we have several of those types of things already, but you know, in expanding that and digitizing it, we can make it just that much more accessible and you know, free up that spot from under your bed or in your garage or in your attic. <laughs> So the other thing we want to invite you to is something called, and if, there, if you guys have any further questions, that's just, you know, yeah. put them in the chat in the box. Chat. Um, also feel free to contact either one of us um, offline. Um, the United Irish Cultural Center has um, strategically um, pivoted to creating basically an outdoor beer garden and dining space called Wawona Gates. Why do we call it Wawona Gates, Jennifer? Because our gates to our parking lot open from Wawona. And uh, some of our people have a favorite brewery in Dublin that has famously the St. James Gates. And funny enough, hmm, our gates kind of look like their gates. <laughs> what is it with gates? You know, it's just one of those things. And, Yes. It, it also, yeah, I mean, we've got this wonderful, the nice thing about this space, and I, I still kind of refer to it as, as a pub, even though I suppose technically it's a beer garden because it's outside. Um, but the way the center is situated, we're on 45th Avenue. And so, and most of our entrances face west into the wind and the salt and the fog. But having the Wawona gates on the north side, you come in and you're behind a three-story building. And so you can be outside and have a pint really nice. and food, but you're kind of protected from the elements. And it really, um, as we've been allowed to do that, has become a, a special space for, you know, for everyone to just come and gather safely. We do enforce masks, distancing, 
you know, ask that you don't come if you're not feeling well. <laughs> But it's, you know, it's, it's a way to still interact here with the center, even though we can't have you yet back inside. And it's also a fabulous place to come after you've walked down the Great Highway and you need a beer while Wona Gates is quickly becoming the place to go to have a beer, to grab some food. Um, as we enjoy the last of our beautiful fall weather, I believe it, start, it opens today at, at 1. And, yes, 1 to um, 8 today. One to eight today. It has Sunday hours as well. Um, Friday hours? Do we? Uh, fr Friday is four to eight. Saturday is one to eight, and Sunday is one to six thirty. And um, we do put sporting events on. We have a couple of uh, large screen TVs. There's music. Um, you can get a good yeah. pour. And frankly, my favorite thing to do in San Francisco these days is bike down car-free Great Highway all the way to Float, park my bike, saunter on in, get my temperature check, get a beer, sit down, and enjoy the beauty of the west side of the city. Um, we think it's, I think it's very, it's not a surprise that the UICC ended up in the west side of the city. I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> woo-woo here for a minute. I think it's not a surprise at all. Uh, I, well, the, you know, the Irish, they just keep moving west. <laughs> and I joke awesome. because my family did the same thing. And it's kind of like, okay, we ran out of land. We'll stop here. <laughs> yes. So in any There's case, no um, if you're interested in knowing more about um, Irish villages at fairs, I have written an essay on the Shamrock Village at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. You can find it on found SF, the wiki of shaping San Francisco, another San Francisco History Days participant. I encourage you to check the essay out. It's an incredibly interesting story. Um, I encourage you to check out the library's online offerings. Um, and um, we are keeping our fingers crossed um, that at some point next year, the library may once again be open for visitors yes uh, one thing to keep in mind with our library is we were never a circulating library and we're still not so um, i'm working with um, the american library association uh, following closely their covid guidelines um, so that i can work out a way that people can make appointments and come in and read and use the physical collection if what we've managed to push out online just isn't enough yet um, but unlike other types of businesses, uh, libraries haven't yet been included in any of the reopening plans. So it's giving me a moment to get it organized for you. <laughs> but at some point, you're still going to have to just come join me at the, you know, sit at the table and yes. enjoy the actual, the actual materials. I have put in the chat uh, the library's website and my email address. For future reference and and you can find me at if you have any follow-up questions you can find me go ahead and use my personal email creely12 at gmail.com that's c-r-e-e-l-y-1-2 at gmail.com um, and I also do a walking tour in the mission district uh, which I haven't done for a while because I have a bum knee but I'm considering doing another one sort of covers this history a little okay. bit uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, my, my <laughs> idea is getting better. Um, but I'm, I'm happy. We can loan you the jaunting car. We can, there is a, the jaunting car. It would be, um, actually, that would be a lot of fun. Don't give me ideas, Jennifer. Don't give me ideas. You got to get it down off that platform. Yeah. Does, um, I, I do have a little video of that that I'm going to put on our Instagram. So, you yeah. Guys, so that those of you who haven't been in the St. Patrick's room in the center will see what we're talking about. But it's a full size jaunting car that would seat probably four to five people up on a platform up in the, up in the rafters of the building. Perhaps that would be, um, I would love to get into the jaunting car. Um, so I'm going to slip into um, uh, San Francisco History Days mode and really encourage people who are watching this to go to San Francisco History Days um, website. You can find it by Googling San Francisco History Days. We have the programs built out um, for Saturday and Sunday. Take a look. Um, there's many, many offerings today. So uh, Self-guided tours, virtual tours. 
um, really just an amazing um, array of historians um, and archivists that are ready to um, tell you stories of the city that you may not know, take you to places you may have never seen. Hopefully, uh, this was um, Hopefully this was one of them. We really, really look forward to welcoming people um, back into the center as soon as we're able. And in the meantime, please do go check out San Francisco History Days and all of the offerings that we have lined up between now and Sunday at, I think, six? Six, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really just an amazing, um, amazing thing. Uh, many thanks to yeah. um, the History Committee, the United Irish Cultural Center for um, allowing us to um, do this. And also don't forget to check out the video uh, 45 on 45, which pr premiered yesterday, which shows the history of Irish centers from the south of Market to this one at 2745th Avenue. Yeah. The link is live on the SF History Days website um, in its premiere time slot on Friday, which I think was 645, but it is hosted on the library's YouTube site, so it will continue to be available afterwards. And if I have worked this tech correctly, um, we will put up a portion of uh, today's conversation with Elizabeth and I on that YouTube channel um, at some point, too. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's going to do it for us um, from the yeah. United Irish Cultural Center and from the Patrick J. Dowling Library, the Room of Requirement, the best <laughs> Irish American history. Oh, we have and, one more question. Oh, do we? Okay. Well, yes. Um, let's see. Let me find you on the list here. Okay. So I've asked you to unmute. Thank you for raising your hand. How? Sorry, it was uh, like a clapping emoji. I just uh, wanted to say that it's, uh, it was a fascinating um, lecture and experience. Thank you. We're so glad Appreciate you could join. That. Yes, thank you for joining us and thank you for your kind words. This is a new adventure, at least for me. <laughs> Does anyone have any further questions? I'm wrapping things up because I'm not saying hands, but if yeah. you do, raise your hand. Yeah, we have about, I think History Days will give us about three more minutes in our slot. So any last little thing you want to see? Oh, if I duck down, there is the Night in the Bowery photo. Oh, and yes. I swear when you look at it closely, you can hear them. Yes. That's a picture that was taken inside Hibernia Hall at 16th yeah. and Valencia in 1934. And it's one of the only known images that survived um, from um, what was called Hibernia Hall, um, that basically where the Irish community gathered. Um, from 1910 until 1973, when it was um, ripped uh, down, there's to date no no you know direct picture of the outside, um, and that image and one San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency archive photo showing it from the side are the only um, pictures which I will never get over. Um, in any case, wow. I think um, I think that's it. So from wow, this, thank you. Yes, no. thank you so much for joining oh, us. Well, we got us one, one more hand. Oh my gosh. One more hand. Sneak it in. Crazy people. <gasps> okay, Coral. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I've said I've sent the if I've pushed the button enough, I think it'll let you unmute yourself. That was applause. No question. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Okay. All right. It's 1059 and I think we're done. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a lovely day for a Guinness now, isn't it? It is a very lovely day for a Guinness. I'll see you at Wabona Gates um, at one o'clock, Jennifer. To all, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. We deeply appreciate it. Have a great weekend.